Okay. Okay, so yeah, just a quick example for commenting and organizing. I pulled up a old script here so we can look at um, just how to do this with some stuff on the board. But basically the first thing that you can do to clean stuff up is We'll do it with just these two. Um, if you highlight any components on the canvas, it'll give you that dotted line around the components you selected. And it's also going to give you some arrows on all of the sides. Um, those can be used to, just like if you were defining how text is aligned, you can like align components to left, right, top, or bottom. So if you click on one of those arrows, it'll align it top, bottom, left, or right, just depending on how you click it. Um, yeah, just a bunch of different options there for doing that sort of stuff. If you want to group things in a similar color, then you can select on a group of components. And if you right click just anywhere off on the canvas, you can select the group button, which is just that green like fidget spinner icon. That'll give you uh, like a box around it. I forget by default if it's going to be like a organic box or a square box, but you can change the shape of the box itself if you right click on it and we can do a blob outline or a rectangular outline or just a overall box. And we can also change that color. I believe it's like a purple by default, but you can come down if you right click again and we can select whatever color we want. So you could have like different color boxes for different uh, sections of your code. And you can also set default colors, like my default color is white, so every time I make a new box, it'll just show up as white, but say this was doing something different, I could make this one purple if I wanted to, with the HSV slider, so it's a little bit different than RGB. But. And then uh, you can also group multiple groups together, so if you wanted to have a super group, you could do that too. And then with the groups, you can name the groups themselves. So if you right click on it again, we could type a group name um, to a group and that'll come up as a little, you know, like chat box above it. But if you want to do a larger name, you can also double click just like you're making a component and type in scribble and that'll come up with that ABC one. With this, you can double click on here and I don't know, type in whatever you want. And then we can also change the size of this so you can make these notes like super massive if you wanted to. Um, and then you could have a title or you know other kinds of hierarchy of, of text in the script itself to organize it. So that's the basics of organizing script stuff. Um, there's also something I can give you as well. You can do screenshots in grasshopper just by doing the normal like screenshot um like the clipping thing for windows or if you're on mac you can use all like command shift for something to do it um in rhino you can do screenshots the same way but you can also do you can also do view capture the file or capture the clipboard or what is it yeah view capture the clipboard and that'll take a better screenshot so you can do whatever resolution you want for a screenshot and remove the background from Rhino if you want to as well. Um, so capturing the clipboard just goes to the clipboard to file you can save the image. Either way it kind of does the same thing. For Grasshopper though there's also a better way to take screenshots. I'll see if I can find it quick. Um, but I have this a Python component that takes a high res screenshot for you of your entire canvas. 
So that'll be the best thing to use if you want to get the most detailed photos of Grasshopper. Let's see. <laughs> okay, so let's see. I'll give you all this grasshopper file. Um, which what it does is it basically just saves a screenshot. Um, to your computer. I do think you have to have the plugin MetaHopper though to make this work, um, but it will give you the highest quality screenshot you can get in one click so you don't have to like screenshot five different times. MetaHopper, yeah. Um, and I can put a Food for Rhino link as well. Okay, so let's see. So this is the one I'll give you. Um, Okay, basically what you have to do with this to take a really nice screenshot is in the blue panel, put in the location on your computer that you want to save the photo to. So if that's going to be your downloads folder, um, on Windows at least, you can open up the file browser and copy whatever folder as a path, which will just copy it as text on your clipboard. Um, so if you copy the downloads folder as a path, you can come into Grasshopper and paste that here. Um, it will paste it with, uh, let me just do it, the downloads. So if you paste it in here, it'll paste it with the, um, the quotation marks. So you just want to make sure to take those out. So it just says like C colon and then whatever your folder name is. And once you have that in there, you can set, like, just go down this list of panels and set the file name. So whatever you want your screenshot to be titled. And then I'm also putting, like, an image number in here. So if you want to take, like, a bunch of different images, you can just update this one, two, three, four, five. It's saving as a PNG. And then once you've put in your location and your file name, if you just hit take a screenshot, we'll get this black window that comes up. That'll take the image, and then it'll save it to our downloads. So we have a high res photo of Grasshopper here. Um, it's removing the canvas like background, so just a really nice clean photo um, with nothing, nothing in it. So I would recommend that for taking good screenshots. I'm gonna send it right now. I'm gonna put another note in here. You can also set the background color. Um, so I'll put a note for that. Right now it's just white as you saw. Um, but you can change that with the color swatch. That's where it saves. That's the button. Okay, so I'll send this over.
Yeah, usually what I do is put I, I put the screenshot tool like up top and then take a screenshot. It's going to include it, but yeah, just crop it. Cool. Okay, cool. So it should be in the file sharing channel. Okay, on that, does anyone have questions to start off today? Oh, I also brought TPU for you. Um, put this mic down. If you want to. Yeah, it's a like a TPU. Okay. Yeah. I have no idea, like the if it'll hold air since it does like foam up. But you can definitely try it. Um, I can bring in. I have. I don't have any rolls here today because those are from a graduate student's work. Um, but I do have. She's printing the jets, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah, for the John Singer Sergeant painting. Did you go see her? No, I didn't. I didn't okay. Yeah, well, we should go back when the dress is finished because it looks really cool. Okay. But I do have spools that have like barely any filament left on them at home that I can bring in. I don't know what to do with them, so we can definitely use them for class. Yeah. Did you make that thing? Oh, you? yeah. Just a resin print. Very nice. Yeah. So any jewelry stuff, we can resin print it very easily. Yep. That's totally fine, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I can show a building facade from last year as well, or last semester, if I can find it. Yeah, we did a facade like this before. It's kind of that Voronoi pattern. And that's the final render in Lumion, I think. So it's wearing a building. That's yeah, so, <laughs> well, I didn't do this, but okay. I came here trying to figure out how to do this. Gotcha. So, oh, very interesting. It's a very like cultic epic pattern. Uh -huh. And it's this was I downloaded it was bumped to file in. Mm -hmm. So I was just bumped it in and it was a that's why it took months to figure out how to do it. Okay. Where where did you get it from? Was it parametric architecture or Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Do you have any questions on it today? Or if, I could also take a look at it on my computer if you want to share it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and then when you get a chance, if you could send the Rhino file along with it. Yeah. For which one? It, just the 3DM file, yeah.
I did not know you could twist the comments. So that's very fun. Cool. Oh yeah, I have a question at some point if um, someone in person doesn't. Yeah, um, we're just gonna take a look at this one quick and then you can definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just wanna, you know. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Joe, what's up? Um, okay. So I, my, for my project, I'd like to do some type of um, like parametric shoe. Mm -hmm. And in the practices that we did, like the one with the wrist, we had it just go around the wrist, but not kind of go around the hand. So I guess my problem is kind of figuring out because I imagine, so I have the foot as a base mesh and then mm -hmm. I somehow want to wrap that foot to create a surface from it but i don't really know how or the best way to do that because you can't really draw like two points and then loft it and then yeah um so you like yeah i mean how to make it like less this? tentacle leave and more foot like but yeah yeah you're like if the tentacle thing was the foot you're trying to make something around <laughs> it yes yeah, like okay it would go around, but it would oh. go around the front part too. Oh, okay. So not this at all. Okay. That's crazy. Um, do you want? Do you have a drawing of it or? Uh, I mean, it's just basically just like a shoe going around a foot. But I want it. But it. But unlike a shoe, yeah. I, I want it to be based more about like the foot dimensions right so it's like custom made for gotcha, that gotcha. My feet. Yeah. and then maybe uh the whole pattern is different so obviously toward the bottom the holes will probably be smaller but then as it goes just slightly higher maybe it's a bit wider yeah so is your question like how to make the shape off the foot right yeah it's how to make the shape off the foot because okay. it needs to kind of enclose the foot rather than just kind of wrap around one part of it Yes. Do you have a scan to work off of, or yeah, I have a scan. To start with, uh, yeah. Okay. Can um, you want me to, can I? Sh share you it? could send it. I was gonna try to find a, a file of my own, but if you have one, we could take a look at it. Yeah. Do you just how do you drop how do you drop them into? Um. I mean, you could either just send it as whatever file type you have, um, in the file sharing channel, or you could put it in Rhino and save it as a Rhino file and send that. Yeah, so I have it. Yeah, I'll just drop it in the Discord. Um, okay. I have it as a. Okay, I'll put it in file sharing. Okay, cool. Yeah, so the, let's see. The easiest way to make something off of this mesh um, is first going to be to close it because I noticed the top was open. Um, so if we, why isn't it showing anything? Okay, I don't know why the mesh is saying it's invalid, but we can fix that. Yeah, very weird. Um, so, I mean, you're gonna have the same problem too, I would assume, but we can rebuild the mesh with a pufferfish component. Um, and I usually set it up just like this. Um, so, Basically, what it's saying is to recompute the mesh because something's broken. Um, take out anything that's not being used, like any double faces or something like that. Unify everything so weld it together, and then on the weld to combine vertices within the tolerance of 0.01. So when we plug the mesh in, 
it is no, no longer invalid, so that's good. So then we should be able to close it, which will add a top face there. So doing that kind of fixes, cleans up the mesh. And then, I mean, the easiest way to add a surface on top of it is to do the... The only thing is I don't, right? I don't want it to be the whole, whole leg part. Right. Right. Um, so we, yeah, we'll get to that. I mean, hopefully this is like pretty self-explanatory so far, like just offset the mesh. That'll yeah, give then, you, no, that makes sense. Yeah. Like the part on top of it. Um, I like the one from Pufferfish cause you can automatically create a solid, um, which I believe will just be off of the mesh. So it has like an internal cavity, which actually let's set up a clipping plane to look at this better. So you can see it has like a wall thickness and then the internal volume um, just by doing that offset. And you can, you can change the distance of this just with the distance here. So this is just a one millimeter offset. Um, but if you wanted to do just the foot, so let's take this away. Um, you would have to do a Boolean operation, and there's a couple ways to do that. The first one would be to use the mesh intersection. And with that, we could set up a box around the section that you want to keep. So say we just want this foot, then we can scale it to be just larger than the foot. And we'll bring this in as a B rep um, since it's just a primitive geometry type. So we'll set that and then we can convert this into a mesh so we can fulfill the mesh intersection. And the intersection is gonna take what's inside of both shapes. So if we do the box and then the foot, that will give us Just what's inside, if I can select it. So that gives us this shape. And then you could do the same process where you offset from here. OK. Um, so I'll show that quick because uh, if we use the mesh pre-closing it, um, I believe that might help you a little bit more. Okay, it's still closed from that action. Um, hmm. I was trying to find a way to get it to be open up top so it doesn't like close it off and fully wrap the foot. Hmm. We could probably bypass the closed mesh and offset it to begin with. And again, you can change this distance. And then if we cut it, with the intersection. Okay. Then that'll give you this shape. So offset of the foot, but still open on top. So you still have that interior cavity. So that's what I would do, Joe, if that helps. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Yes. Um, let me save this and I'll send that over. Yeah, because then I then I could play around with different um like how high it goes up or maybe it's maybe it's just a slip on so that box is kind of a lower portion, just kind of different section. Yeah. And if if you wanna make a say, right, you made a we made a box and it was a B rep, but if I want to make a custom shape, yeah. what would that yeah. be? Um In which run do you have? Six, seven? Seven, seven. Okay. So I, I would recommend using the subdies to do that, um, which are right here. So you can make whatever shape you want with the sub D practices that we've gone over in the last couple of classes. Um, are you familiar with the sub Ds? Yeah, yeah, a little bit in terms of yeah. kind of push and pull it in. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, up to you how complex you would want to make it. Um, I believe there's also videos linked from the very beginning of the course. Um,
somewhere recordings yeah thank you um yeah and these these go over sub d stuff too if you're curious but all you'd have to do is replace the b rep with a sub d component and then to get the sub d to be a mesh you'd go mesh from sub d and then wire it up like that and just replace it right there and that should that should be all you need to change so okay yeah sounds good i'll play awesome. around with it sounds good thank you yeah and then richard did your rhino work yeah yeah perfect okay yeah okay how how to open outlook still not comfortable with it we'll figure it out okay um, which email did you send it to I don't think I see it in here. Okay. Okay, cool. Is it just facade surface? Okay, cool. Okay, fun. Um, let's. Okay. Yeah, let me see. So, like, each one of these sections is a different. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're is it, it's based on like just a flat surface, and then it does this to it. Okay. Um, so what's the question? on this just like what did they do like break it down okay yeah um let's see so i assume they started with hmm. weird And just did like a yeah. I'm just gonna do a flap. I don't know why this is. Does my keyboard not work? Very weird. Um, okay. Yeah, we'll go with this. Um, Okay, cool. Ooh. Very interesting. Um, okay, I'm going to change the colors a little bit so maybe this is easier to see. Okay, so whenever I try to break down a script, I like to turn on this green cylinder button, which basically only displays screens at kind of a weird angle. Um, okay, yeah, I like to turn on, turn on this green cylinder, which basically only displays the component that you click on. So as we go through, we can see like this one shows the surface. This next one is just rebuilding the surface, um, which is looking like it's rebuilding it 
to have a certain number of u and v, so like divisions in the up and the left and right direction. Um, yeah, this one's adding points to it. It's adding it in a very interesting way, though, because it's more intense by the edges, um, which I do wonder if the rebuild service has anything to do with that. Oh, it looks like it does. Okay. Um, so this UV. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Uh huh. Like, yeah. Did you just like get this file? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, try well, I'm trying to break it down in my head to see exactly what they're doing. I mean, it. Yeah, it looks like they're getting this bump. Uh, so you doubled this up, right? So that's why it looks like, okay. Okay. Because, but um, this looks. Consistent to you, like how it was originally. Yeah. Okay. I think we just take two of those. Yeah. Ones. Okay. This uh, was a modeling piece. Mm -hmm. that, that was a, yeah, part of the same. Um, I just like the book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, you're good. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if I was doing this, I would, I would probably also break it down into a grid, and then you just have to figure like which points to move outwards, which is, I believe, what they're doing with all of this, because um, it looks like they're taking the the domains of the extents of the shape and breaking it down so they can extract each cell. Um, so we get these like little tiny squares. And then I believe with the squares, they're figuring out like which square to move out to make that pattern. Um, which when we've done stuff like this in this class um, for making textures on surfaces, uh, we were using the diamond pattern. So we would make like diamond cells instead of square cells like this, and then move them up or down based on how far away they were from a point that we had in the scene. Um, this one, though, it looks like they just have a standard texture that they apply to the whole thing. So it doesn't have like that. Well, I mean, maybe like, does this point have you used like this point for anything before? Not... Okay. Oh, I do see a point all the way over there. Let's see what happens. Hmm. It's taking a second now, but oh, here it is. Yeah, I don't really know what that did. I don't think it. I mean, I assume it's supposed to do something because it is taking a distance measurement from all of the all the midpoints of the squares to that point. Um, but I'm not sure what they're using to calculate with it. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it looks very similar to the to, to that lecture that we did. It's just they have a very standardized pattern here, which I believe is this part coming in where they're finding uh, like just the points to move out of all the points, which this would be all of the points. Um, 
And then, yeah, so we did the same thing. We applied a vector with an amplitude component, which would come in here to move it. So that moves it up. And then they should be rebuilding the surface. So in the tutorial I gave, we were using uh, construct mesh, um, just because we were breaking down an original mesh, which was the plane, and then constructing a new one. When you construct a new mesh, you need the faces of the original mesh, and then also the points. So they're using just the points here to make a new mesh or to make a surface. Sorry, it's a, it's different than a mesh technically, um, but I don't think it's going to matter much for you, like if it's a mesh versus a surface. Um, yeah. But it, yeah, it looks very, it's very similar. The only thing they're doing different than what I was doing is how they're selecting their points to move. I was doing it based on the distance from a point. Um, it looks like they're doing it based on they just set up like a a number. It looks like a value of six. So every six numbers, they select the next one, which I believe is what the series is doing. So you can see like one, six, 11, 16, 21. And then that is going through the grid. And, you know, if you go across, like it'll do, you know, six and then 12 and then 24. And then, and then I believe that's how they're getting this pattern. So if we were to change this, yeah, then you, oh, okay, then you get very different patterns. So I think to your question, like to sum it up, yeah, if you take a look at the lecture recording that we did for the moving the mesh, and then you just use like these four components to get your pattern, then you can use the pattern as how you select what point to move instead of the attractor point, which is what I was doing. Yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Yes, the PDF, yeah. Okay, no, I like these, yeah. Like Phantom of the Opera mixed with like headdress sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And that was just uh, recent, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be fun. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would probably do um, just like what Joe was asking a second ago. Um, which, let me open up a new file. Yeah, so, no, I don't care. So you could either, you know, have someone scan your head if you want to make it off you, or, yeah, the model that I gave will work as well. What was I looking for? I don't have a head shape here. Um, okay. But yeah, after you had the head, you could just use that offset mesh component. Um, that would give you like a little thickness, and then you could fill that in. Mm, yeah, just with the Voronoi one we did in like the very first class. I think that would work. And then it's all on how you define like the section that you're taking from the head. So do you have Rhino 6, 7, 7? So you could do the sub D process and then just like with the sub D box, like define what shape you want, use the mesh intersection to grab just that piece of the head, and then just do the offset from there. That that should work. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it depends which one. If it was like the ender, like the tiny little one. That you, oh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't hate all of Creality. I just hate. We don't have the we don't have the V two Smart Pros. We have the I have a V three, and then we have like just a run of the mill CR ten in the lab. Um, yeah, those are good ones. It's it's the enders that you can get for like around a hundred dollars or under a hundred dollars that I don't trust. But the other quality stuff is pretty good. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
throughout the PLA and have a reinforced metal fiber in the middle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be good. I. Yeah, I mean, if you want to, which one did you say it was again? Okay. <coughs> Um, yeah, in terms of hacking it, it's a good question because usually, like I've bought a bunch of enders to take apart and use for other things. Um, <laughs> I usually go for like the simplest ones, the ones that don't have a lot of automation to them. Because um, this one's got a bed leveling sensor uh, and I don't know how to bypass that. So if, like if you wanted to take the whole nozzle off and replace it, then you'd have to figure out what to do with the bed leveling sensor. Okay. Um, yeah. They have their own proprietary thing. You know, whereas, I was like, you can, some of their cheaper printers are just running some of their firmware as open source. Okay. Um, you'd have to buy one and then buy one. Yeah. It probably just wouldn't have enough motor pinout connections. Yeah, in the firmware. Yeah. Right. It's definitely possible though. Um, because I've I've seen Prusas that they have like a line of ten nozzles and it goes and picks up whichever nozzle it needs, like stuff like that. So you definitely you could. Um but I know like there's a printer out in the biodesign lab, um, which is in the media building. And they have, a, it's like an Ender variant machine. Um, and a company, I think in Canada, like took it apart and, and put a, a pellet extruder on the nozzle. So it grinds the pellets and then extrudes plastic out of it. And it, th that one was pretty easy to, to mod. But those are like the most basic ones where you don't, yeah, well, not the hundred dollar maybe, but like you don't have a full, you know, LCD touchscreen. You don't have a bed leveling sensor because those are sometimes hard to get around. Maybe, yeah. I mean, I've got a pretty good CR10 up in the lab that doesn't have too many sensors on it. It has like a filament runout sensor, but that's it. Um, so I would think that would be pretty easy to mod. Yeah, if you want to take stuff apart. So. Um, I have. My old printer that I sold online is one of the like basic, basic, basic cheap ones, and that's super easy. Um, it's a good option. Yeah, cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, luckily, these printers are not that expensive in like the grand scheme of the last 10 years, so yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, just upstairs in the breezeway, if you go up the stairs and on the right side. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna to try to find a floor plan to lay out the school because they're all on the internet somewhere, but I forget exactly. Uh, any other questions on stuff today? Yeah. Um, I mean, everything they sent me, I just uh, broke apart their PDF and uploaded as images. Oh, so okay. yeah, it's all the same stuff, yeah. But anyone that's in industrial design, um, I expect good books because I know they teach you that. <laughs> no, I'm not in industrial design. What are you talking about? <laughs>
I will I'm an engineer, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <So> nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It goes make a process, and we're all like, huh? I'm like, you better all be using InDesign. <laughs> if you do that, for sure. what is InDesign? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and actually bind a book. Yeah, I did that first year. Yeah. <laughs> oh. I did one time with that. I like didn't drill straight, so then I was like, well, and then you like ten dollars for it, and like ten dollars for one like it doesn't even drill that much. Well, I'll pay for it. Or are, you, are you drilling? Like I sewed my book together. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah we did so much. Oh, okay. Yeah, but you drilled the holes through and, and then you sew it together. How do you get the pages in order? Just do. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> what did, did you use InDesign to do those? No, we, just oh, took our no. we took our actual like pages. Oh, and okay. I was gonna give you some hot tips in InDesign to, because I had to buy a hundred page book, and if you and if you print that. Um, booklet style so front back eight, 11 by 17 so but yeah but page one is connected to page 100 but there's a way in InDesign to like do that so you print it and it's not a hassle so did that for Jonas's, yeah uh, I think it had to be like the physical by four or something yeah yeah <laughs> like told me to take one page out and then i was like gonna <laughs> mess around with it and then you just throw like a white page at the end or like an advertisement or something i did magazines for years so Yep, 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 yep. Would I be able to, I'm most stuck on figuring out how to get the pattern on the bottom of the outsole. I have the mesh, but I have no idea how to get the file that you sent. Okay. Make it through. Do you want to share your Rhino file? Um. Yeah, with both of them? Or. Um. With whatever you want, and I can run it through the reaction diffusion thing. Yeah. Oh, just the um, just the mesh. Yeah. yeah, unless you have like a head start on the grasshopper and want me to look at that too. But if you're just trying to figure out how to put the pattern on the mesh. Yeah. So it's a. I have it as an STL because I yeah. made it in Blender. Mm -hmm. Um. So yeah, I can. Use that. Okay. Cool. Ah, uh, there we go. Okay. Cool. Ooh, very nice. Looks pretty cool. Okay, so you just want to put on like this bottom surface here? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think what I did before for this.
Okay, have you tried to plug it into this reaction diffusion one yet? Um, I did, and it just didn't like it. Um, yeah, it's not. Well, the tri remesh is not liking it, which is weird. <laughs> um, let me see. I don't think we need it, though. Oh, this is also a recipe for disaster right here. Um, I did that one. Oh. <laughs> you crash your computer. Uh, yeah, we're just gonna <laughs> we're just gonna bypass that. I mean, I did that, but let's just we don't need that today. Okay, let's see what happens. Hmm. Okay, it did a thing, but it's like it's going with the density of the mesh, so all the dense areas have a lot of wiggle, which is not great. Um. We could maybe try to quad remesh first, because for some reason the uh, tri remesh doesn't want to work. It's a very odd geometry. I have a feeling that I did some sketchy things <laughs> as far as like how to get the shape. So I'm feeling like inside of the mess. Yeah, I mean that might be why the remesh doesn't like it. Um, one thing I you only have seven Rhino seven. Oh yes. Okay. Well, I'm gonna try to shrink wrap it first Rhino eight, but I just wanna. I'm just curious. This usually solves like mesh issues pretty pretty quick. Yeah, a little bit cleaner. Let's see if it wants to remesh it now. It's thinking about it. Okay, that worked. So maybe it is some weird mesh thing that's going on there. Okay, so. Okay, that's a lot more uniform. I'd like to see that. Um, so the pattern is like all over. I think what I've done before is just limit where the pattern can go. Um, so with that, we can bring in like an attractor point method um, because all it's really doing is it's doing all this calculation, but all that adds up to is a movement vector. So if we cancel out all the movement vectors that are not on the bottom of the shoe, then we can like limit how far the pattern is going. Um, I'm just going to do that with a simple line right now. But again, we've done this in past classes. You can make this like a hundred different points if you want, or like a better line that selects stuff better than this line will. But let's put this in quick. So we can set the curve. We can divide the curve into points and then we can just do a searching thing uh, with the closest point components so we'll want to search from the line so that'll start and then we search into the cloud of points which the cloud of points is just going to be the deconstruct mesh here which is all the points from the shoe so That'll find the distance between everything. So if we were to preview that, as we commonly do, then we'll see like lines, which actually, I believe it should be the other way around, because we want to find a distance between every single point. So I'm just going to switch that quick. OK, so now we have a line from every point to every point on the line that we set. So that looks good. So with that distance, we can just call out um, we could use just a like a less than operation and say that any point less than whatever value is the correct value, which I'm not sure what that's going to be. 
So maybe we'll just go to a hundred. Maybe we'll just go to a hundred on that. And then that'll give you a true false pattern. And then we can just use that to call out um, all the points from here. So with that set up, let's see. Now we're like getting just the ones around that line, which this isn't the perfect bottom of the shoe, but you can make it, you can make it closer. Okay, so with that, we don't really wanna remove the points. We just wanna set the movement vectors to zero at every other place on this. So let's extend this out a little bit. So let me think. Okay, so we know that right now it's keeping all the ones that are less than 0.83. Um, so I believe all the false ones are getting deleted. So if we check the list for every time it says it's false, so we can use a toggle for that. So basically what the member index does is it finds every position where it's false, it'll give us the index of that position, which we want this one instead. So now we see we have a list of numbers everywhere where it's false, and we can use that list to replace the vector um, numbers. So at every time we get one of these indexes, just replace with zero. So with this, we have the original list that we want to change, which is the vectors. We have the item to replace with. So we want to replace all the ones too far away with just don't move, so zero. And then we have the indices to do the replacement at all the locations, which are going to be these numbers, which is every time it says it's false. So we had this. If we replace that, let's see what it gives us now. What is it not like? Text. Okay, so this needs to be a movement vector. So let me backtrack. Instead of replacing the vector itself, let's just replace the number coming into the amplitude which this one is just going to be numbers. This is vectors, which is why it's giving me that error. So we will start with the amplitude numbers and then use that there. That'll then give us vectors. And now we have this shape. Okay, cool. So now it just has the pattern at just the bottom there where that line is. So you can make this line like, I don't know, squiggly back and forth to find more or whatever you have. And then you should be able to change this to get that pattern to extend out a little bit, which this number is way too massive. Yeah, that should work, so. Um, yeah, we can uh, clean this up a little bit and I'll share that with you. So. Cool. Does that seem to make sense for that? Yes. Okay. Um, was there a way I could take it, I guess? Yeah. We could even just like make another part, I guess. Um, some shoes will have the texture to accept it. Mm -hmm. You could. Um, I was thinking about that because the output of this is going to give you, like if you did that, it would give you a surface. Mm -hmm. And it's like, how do you weld the surface back onto the shoe? Yeah. Um, it might just be more than this process. But it's definitely, a, it's a good method. You could do that. Um, so, yeah, two different methods. Either would work. But I, I, I thought this might be a little bit less um, components to, to make work, so. so yeah. Okay, so let me internalize these and I'll just share this back with you. Oh, yeah. 
Um, okay, cool. I also just realized you don't have shrink wrap. So let me just send you the file that I did shrink wrap. I sent you the grasshopper, but it's not going to have that component. How does the tab look with the shrink wrap? That's where I think. Ah, uh, I see. Really this one? Yeah. Yeah. Which all shrink wrap is doing is it's it works on a voxelization process. So it's the same thing as dendro. So you could take your original shape, throw it into dendro, just make it super high res. Um, with those mesh settings, uh, like you would put a super low number in the settings, turn that into a volume, it will solve all your mesh issues, and then you just got to pop it back into a into a mesh output. This will do the same thing that trend wrap does pretty much. So, yeah. You know. Okay, cool. Questions? Yeah, go for it. I'm going to send a mesh to you, but I think it might be a good question. Okay. The grasshopper file also has that workflow that you had. The okay. But like, gotcha. Started yeah. Do I need the file, the mesh that you sent, or does this have everything? I think it has, it has everything. Okay, cool. Um. So I was looking at how I could populate it less obviously because the pipe takes out the scraps of the This one. Okay. Um. Oh yeah, it's not. So if you you're saying if you plug so it in, I it freaks plug out. It in, yeah, then it just. Okay. Yeah. Um. Yeah, let's see. What I would do to get around this maybe is just go with a dendro workflow for doing the pipe. So. Actually. Do you know like what radius value works well for the pipes? I haven't. Okay, we can figure it out. Okay, so this is, yeah, this is going super big, super low detail. So let's bring this in. Okay. That looks pretty close. Yeah, that looks pretty nice. What do you think? Yeah. yeah. Can you still install the ability to customize so the pattern layout? Or I mean, you could do anything before Dendra, you can still change. Yeah. Dendra is just for like doing the pipe part. Um, yeah, so you, you still have access to all this. You could, I mean, you could with Dendro have an attractor point and say the thickness of the pipe is different at variable spots. Yeah, you could do that. You interested? Okay. Let me see then. It looks like in the previous report there was an attractor point against the uh, um, DNA. But I tried. Oh, do I? Hitting that and it didn't seem to have anything. You're saying I have that in here already? Uh, Maybe. I, yeah, it's close to the top of the workflow. Okay. The um. Like up to the left. Yeah, you see the thing. 
Yeah, no, I see the point. I see what you're talking about. Let me see. I I know. I know it. I have something. Let me try to find it. Yes. Okay. Okay, so I believe this one input point input curve. Okay, so we can add our curves curves to this and then add an attractor point, and then we can change the uh, thickness of the curve at different points. So let's try that. Yeah, about center. Okay, so it looks like our radius has to be pretty small for this to work. Um, so basically how I set this up is it's just dendro inside the cluster. Um, and it's got the domain start and domain end. So what do you want the smallest value to be? And then what do you want the largest value to be? Uh, in the gradient. And then when it comes back, it should show, yeah, the thickness close is really big, and then as it gets to the end, it's a lot smaller. So it looks like it's working. It's just hard to see at this point um, with how it is currently set up. So it takes 25 seconds. Let's see what that does. Yeah. Is there a way to change the range around the point? Mm -hmm. um, right now, this one is just the farthest point away is defining the end of the gradient, and then the closest point is the start. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you, you could break it open and look at what all is happening. Let me just move this a little bit. I think something that should be more beneficial would be mm -hmm. like, kind of like, I remember my project last year and then we set the data structure up mm -hmm. on the foot. Uh, we included, like, I don't know if you have to do this the same way with that though, but yeah. I just had spheres and it was everything within that sphere became more populated. I don't mm -hmm. know if there's a way with the points if it could just be like a certain, a certain distance from the point. Um, yes. Yeah, I mean, right now what you could do with it is there is the graph mapper component. So you could say, um, or like you could have it just fall off to nothing. So, which doesn't really give you a good control over the exact distance, but throughout the whole thing, you can say a lot at the start and then none as it gets farther. Um, and you would also need the rich graph mapper plugin for this to work up to you though if you wanted to be within a circle though um i mean if you have the script from last year i wonder if you could yeah, use I stuff from it yeah um because what was it the voro boot or yeah it was a Voro. yeah I still have all the concerns, so I can look into it. Like okay. Essentially, I just want like the balls of the foot and the heel to be a little like the radius to be a little more like be larger, where mm -hmm. like, the other areas where the touch point does like it's a similar concept. Yeah. Um, oh, you because you were doing the density of the Voronoi. I see. Yeah, so it's a little different. Like, yeah. Um, 
like you want the density of the crystalline to be more at a certain position? Not, I mean, if it would be easier just to have for weighted to where it is that the pipe be less. So yeah, I think that would be easier. So it appears like it's more open in mm -hmm. some areas than others. Mm -hmm. Essentially, it's just supposed to be like a visual representation. Like a yeah. Yeah, I mean, what you could do, six a point, let's see. Instead of doing the graph mapper part, you could just do an includes test and then set up a domain for that. So then you could really define um, like how close and how far you want the pattern to exist within. And then we could probably do the same thing as we did a few minutes ago. So we could check for all the ones that are falling outside. and just replace those values with the smallest one. So this would be all the radius values, which we want to replace with those indexes. And then, wait, actually, sorry, this is the original list. And then, I mean, you could just do another slider here. I don't know if you want like the smallest or the biggest to be the one that it gets replaced with, but. I will say target areas the Right. Yeah. Okay, so that's the like sphere of influence on this shape. So that's not too big. So then let's see if we change. Okay, so you can kind of see that now. It's like within the sphere is only the thick parts. Okay, yeah, that's more visible. Um, let's put this maybe at the edge of the shoe, just like right there or something. I think this will work, yeah. Let's see. Yeah, it's definitely making it thicker. I mean, it's a little hard to see, but you can control the values of it. But compared to like here versus here, yeah. Okay. And if I wanted to incorporate multiple, can I plug like multiple spheres into the same? Yeah, so it's a good question. Let me set it up for that. So you just have to replace the distance with the closest point, which will give you a distance, but um, only the points that are closest to the attractor point. That you want. Um, so I believe if you do that, let's just check with a line. So start end. And uh, I don't think that's doing it. So let's flip it just like we did last time. Okay. So that's a line looking to every point. So if we had multiple points, that should work. Um, so we'll get rid of the distance and just replace all of these outputs to this distance. That should change nothing currently. Yeah, so it's only thicker right there. But if we had another point, let's say over there somewhere, it's pretty good. Plug these both in. Okay, now you've got like those two thick sections. So you could have as many points as you want at this at this stage, and that should work. Yeah. Hey, yeah, welcome. And then for the for crystalline, yeah. When it forms, is it, it gets confined to like the measurements of the two meshes, the starting meshes. 
Correct. Yeah. yeah. So in theory, I know it's not the most effective way, but to kind of keep the grasshopper file intact and all of the values mm -hmm. and like with some like one like random things. If I were to bring this into like, for instance, mm -hmm. like, like I'd have a problem using this body to a body mm -hmm. created in Fusion if it's the exact same profile as the mesh interviews. I mean, I find yeah, I'm not sure because I haven't worked with Fusion to Rhino too much, like yeah. Fusion meshes together. I'd give it a shot though. Yeah. yeah. Like as long as you're not importing, exporting as different uh, scales, then it should just import the exact same like yeah. size. Yeah. Yeah. So. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, any other questions? So Kathleen, are you printing again for fun or maybe yeah, you get I'm less holes in it? I'm going to print it again and see if it doesn't fail here this yeah. time. Um, and I'll just really talk to this one Yeah. Um, and then I'll see if I can roll it up this time. Cool. I can roll it this way. That's not going to be it. Yeah, maybe put some hot glue on all the holes and then just okay. crank the, the pressure. I thought about that before we started, but... <laughs> I figured it wouldn't work. Oh, I believe the blue one is Ninja. That's a really old print, and all they had was Ninja back then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they were using Ninja Flex, or? Yeah. Okay. I don't know if it's like, I don't know if it's like, I filament it was because a lot of people say ninja flex for flexible filament which is not that helpful because it's a just a very specific brand name is ninja flex so oh yeah you could do dendro uh, yeah so if you have a mesh, we can use the mesh to volume. And you also need to create settings with that as well to define the voxel scale for Dendro. Um, for the settings, I like to use a slider that starts at 0.01 and then go up to 1. Um, just because that gives us a pretty good range, but always make sure to put the slider up to one to start, mm -hmm. just because the lower the number, the more chance that we'll crash our laptops. So we'll just start high and we'll figure out what number works. But you can plug that into S for the settings and then wire the settings into the mesh to volume. Um, and then if we take our mesh into that, that should convert that into a volume. Um, it might look like a blob at first though, but you can take the slider down to a low number until it looks like the sole. And then we'll just have to convert it back into a mesh to go into the rest of our script. So there's another volume to mesh component in Dendro. So we can wire the volumes together. 
And then it just also needs a setting um, wired into it so we can just use the same settings and wire that in. And that should do, uh, should fix any of the mesh issues, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. So, yeah, it should be right there. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you right click on the one above and go to properties. Okay. I mean, I don't see it there. Um, I know it was another one, but I don't know why. Yeah, and it's not showing up in here. In a okay. What I would probably I don't do. Know why? Because I truly thought I had that one. Like you had it before. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it is weird. What I usually do when this happens is just take Lunchbox out of the folder that it's in for Grasshopper, like delete um, this Lunchbox. All, like all this stuff yeah. yeah so if you just take that out um, and then i usually just download it again and then re-import it which yeah it's not going to let you all rhinos open um so yeah you just close rhino delete it download it again and i i like to unblock it when it's still in the zip file and then unzip it yeah Um, would anyone want an InDesign 20 minutes? No? Nope. You all love Google Slides? Okay. We already have one there. Okay, okay. <laughs> don't like it. It's my favorite software ever. Yeah. Uh, just publishing. I usually use it for magazines. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I like it for anything that has to be printed. Um, just because of, yeah, it's layout capability, it's um, all the color matching tools it has, if you're doing spot color or CMYKs for printers, is really nice. Um, and whenever I do like uh, freelance work for banners or trade shows or stuff, it's, I feel like the most professional way to package anything that has to be printed, yeah. <laughs> I love InDesign. If I could not use Photoshop and Illustrator, I would just use InDesign. But that's not possible. <laughs> Bold. I'm Illustrator for real. I did my entire process with Illustrator. I tried to, and then it started like crashing. So yeah, I had to switch to InDesign. Yeah. Why would it start? Why would it start crashing? I there's, had, there's too um, many artworks in it. Yeah, I had a bunch of like really yeah. high res photos, yeah. and it has yeah. to fully kind of like render them out each time you need to do anything with it. Versus mm. InDesign and does it as like a very low quality mode, um, so it mm -hmm. keeps it really fast, but it yep. visually looks kind of weird. Yeah, and then when you export it, there's like a way to Has anyone told you about exporting with color conversion in InDesign? I know. Yeah. Not, yeah. Okay. Cool. Good. Because I, when I was in like second year, I was like, "Why is nothing pure black?" 
That's the most annoying thing ever. But yeah, because um, usually the issue is like if you make something on the computer, like you're seeing it in RGB, but you'll print in CMYK. So if you if you think it's all black and you print and it's like a bluish green, like that's really annoying. Um, but in InDesign, all you have to do is, well, I'll start over. So when you export, it's important to put it into Adobe PDF for print, not for interactive. So that'll set it up. And then all of this stuff is normal, um, like the general. So if you're exporting like all your pages, then that works. Compression, you don't have to change. Um, if you're sending it to a publisher, then marks and bleeds are important because of how they print. But for these printers, they shouldn't matter. Output those the most important. So if you convert destination, preserving the numbers, because that's just the easiest way to do it, you can choose your destination, which I usually go for Photoshop CMYK. And that'll transition everything over to printer speak. So you can actually print with CMYKs. And then including the destination profile is good as normal. And then if you export like this, then when you print it out on a printer here, it'll look like what it looks like on the screen. Yeah. Um, which also, when you're in InDesign, um, where is it? Um, in the document setup, you can also design in either print or web. If you're designing in print, then it's going to it's going to show you CMYKs like on the screen, which is a little weird. So if you export this as interactive for web, then it might look different. So I usually go in the web setup. So then your RGBs are actually what you're going to export because if you're working in print, then when if you export for the internet, then it's going to look a little bit weird. So just to note on that as well, because it can also look weird on the screen. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Um, yeah, if there are any more questions, I'll answer them. If not, have fun at TOTS. <laughs> so. People can be very convincing, though. Uh -huh. I didn't want to go at first, but it's something more and more fun as I think about it. <laughs> I just love when the floor, like, curves in. <laughs> yeah, there's too many people. It's just like... Well, like, right? oh, yeah, it's more, int like, it's more fun that you're all, like, yeah. shaking. There's just a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, I don't trust the structural integrity. <laughs> you took them to TOTS? No. You took them to... I mean, they went to Oh, yes. Please. That is very true. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I'm trying to see if I can to sort of like look and see what yeah. it will look like. Mm -hmm. So we had done the trimesh and it gave us just fixes. Yep. But then when we went to pull them out, we still went on which one to use to do to do what because we mm -hmm. and we took and then we had like another slider or another yeah. what do you call it module? A component. Another yeah. Component that Right, so that was, I think, in the length, yeah. Mm -hmm. The slider? Yeah, oh, okay. The slider I have, and that was connected to the length. And when you said that earlier, it just changed it to one. Mm -hmm. Is that for everything? Oh, that's just for Dendro. That's just what I like to do. Um, yeah, for you it's completely different. So I, I never really know what to start a slider at. Um, so I just go for a range and see what works. For you though, like this is mapping like 0.25 is going to be 0.25 inches in Rhino. Um, so if you knew like how big that, uh, like the arm cylinder was. Yeah.
Okay, then you can kind of get a sense of like 0.25 inches is going to be, you know, that in relation to the, the full nine inches. Um, so that's just what that is doing. Yeah. That's going to make them play together. Yep. Because the length, basically, it's controlling the length of each line. Yeah. So each line you're seeing is now like 0.5 inches. So yeah, you're going to have less lines, but larger lines. Because you create more space. What that was, because I thought that when we exploded it before we did the fiber, we actually gave it that. Um, it was creating um, the ribs or. Yeah, because we gave depth to all the edges, like we added a oh, thickness to all the edges. Is that what you're talking about? Right. You're welcome. See you next week. Um, yeah, so we were using a, I think it was just a pipe component to do that. Yeah. Okay.